A woman's place is in the A smart woman reigns. Dumb broad. If you want to make decisions in this family, go out and earn a paycheck yourself. Can you type? Dumb broad. It's a woman's duty to make herself attractive. Women are always trying to trap some man. A woman who can't hold a man isn't much of a woman. Women's, Women's talk is all chatter. and women, images and realities. The University of Michigan Television Center presents a series of programs on the nature and potential of American women. Your host is Lynn Mattoon of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Michigan. Today's program, How the World Sees Women, explores the images of women presented in the mass media. Today we're going to investigate some images and stereotypes of women, past and present. First we'll see a theater piece by University of Michigan students spoofing some of these ideas. A woman's work is never done. Working women are unfeminine. I never felt fulfilled until I had a baby. All women think about are clothes. All you do is cook, clean, and sit around all day. If you want to make decisions in this family, go out and earn a paycheck yourself. Some of my best friends are women. Aye, she's beautiful when she's angry. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made her a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. God created Adam Lord of all living creatures, but Eve spoiled it all. Martin Luther. Pythagoras said, There is a good principle which created order, light, and man, and an evil principle which created chaos, darkness, and woman. I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast not created me a woman. Nearly Orthodox Jewish prayer for men. Blessed be the Lord, who has created me according to his will. Nearly Orthodox Jewish prayer for women. A study by the Equal Opportunity Commission shows that 28 million women in America work in more menial jobs at lower pay and suffer higher unemployment than men. 40% of all working age women work. In 1900, the typical woman worker was 26 and single. Now she is 41 and married. In 10 out of 14 clerical and office jobs, men got higher pay than women for identical work. Overall, the median wage for women is only 60% that of for men. The Public Health Service shows men lose more days from work each year than do women, including days lost for pregnancy and childbirth. Clerical work is the single largest woman's occupation. The next largest woman's occupation is service work. One quarter of all professional women in 1964 were in the health professions, the largest single occupation being nurses, followed by dental and medical technicians. In the 1965 handbook on women workers published by the Women's Bureau in the Labor Department. The Chase Manhattan Bank found that the average housewife works a 99.6 hour work week. Samuel Johnson said, A man in general is better pleased when he has a good dinner than when he has a wife who talks Greek. 
The whole education of women had to be relative to men. To please them, to be useful to them, to make themselves loved and honored by them. To educate them when they are young, to care for them when they grow, to counsel them, to console them, and to make life sweet and agreeable to them. These are the duties of women at all times, and what should be taught them from infancy. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The Confucian Marriage Manual tells us that the five worst infirmities that afflict the female are indocility, discontent, slander, jealousy, and silliness. It would be preposterously naive to suggest that a BA can be made as attractive to a girl as a marriage license. Dr. Grayson Kirk, former president of Columbia University. A girl's wedding day is the happiest day of her life, the day she passes from the bondage of her father to that of her husband. Did you know that you were your husband's prisoner? You must live wherever he pleases, or else you are guilty of desertion and entitled to nothing. According to the marriage contract, your husband is entitled to more household services from you than he would get from a live-in maid. So why aren't you getting paid? Under law, you're only entitled to bed and board. In Italy, a woman can go to prison for a year for refusing to make love to her husband. According to the United Nations, marriage is a slavery-like practice. Do you promise to love, honor, and obey? Obey, 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 obey. No! Who is that lady I saw you with last night? That was no lady. That was my wife. <laughs> Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. What a mad idea to demand equality for women. Women are nothing but machines for producing children. Napoleon Bonaparte. Women should be struck regularly, like gongs. The great question which I have not been able to answer despite my 30-odd years of research into the feminine soul is, what does a woman want? Sigmund Freud. Alexander Pope believed that most women have no characters at all. According to Aristotle, we should regard the female nature as afflicted with the natural defectiveness. A woman is only a woman. But a good cigar is a smoke. Rudyard Kipling. Abby Hoffman said, the only alliance I will make with women's liberation is in bed. And D.H. Lawrence wrote, man is willing to accept woman as an equal, as a man in skirts, as an angel, a devil, a baby face, a machine, an instrument, a bosom, a womb, a pair of legs, a servant, an encyclopedia, an ideal, or an obscenity. The only thing he won't accept her as is a human being, a real human being of the female sex. Women are like elephants. They're nice to look at, but I wouldn't want to own one. Here today to talk about this theater piece are Kathy Shortridge, a freelance writer, 
and um, Sharon Lowen, who was in the piece, she is a senior at the University of Michigan. Kathy, what did you think about that piece? I was, I was uh, surprised that it was so bad. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, it would be wrong to say that I really enjoyed it, all those unpleasant and negative images that were coming through. I thought it was very well done, of course, but uh, constantly showing women as servants, mothers, some sort of adjunct to a man, uh, actually does deprive a woman, I think, of the, her own individuality, the fact that she's a human being to begin with in the first place. Uh, well, it was sort of the so many words, people actually saying, uh, perhaps everybody understood that women are that way, to actually say it, that sort of surprised yeah, me. Yeah, that's why. How did you get the idea? I wanted to use it. Well, I got the idea from reading an anthology on women's liberation called Sisterhood is Powerful. And I haven't really thought about the whole issue much more than anyone who is a woman, reads the media, reads articles on women's liberation. And there was a section in the, in the book called Know Thy Enemy. And it was a collection of the quotes that I used and quite a few others by um, learned men, distinguished thinkers from the Bible, people whose authority we respect. And it was incredible to me to realize what they thought about women. Uh, for instance, that Sigmund Freud asked, what does a woman want? You know, it was amazing that he could say something like this. It seems as if it should be clear to someone like Freud that uh, women are people we, we, and individuals we want and men have want. human yeah. drives like, like other right. human beings. I think that title, uh, Know Thy Enemy, is appropriate not only for a woman looking at the m people who have written about women and said these mm -hmm. negative things, but uh, so many of the men that were mentioned there really did seem to view women as enemies. Uh, not just as different from men, yes. but as being evil in some sense. Yeah, yeah biblical this image. people jo joke about the war between the sexes, and I, I think mo many of us are sort of unconscious that there is such a thing, so it strikes one as... Uh, Yes. I thought it was somewhat alarming, know thy enemy, <laughs> and it turns out that really, <laughs> indeed, you're an enemy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I used the, at the very ending, the last quote, to sort of sum that up, that D.H. Lawrence said, all these things that men will accept women as, you know, as uh, a machine, as, you know, different kinds of objects, servants to take care of men, but the only thing he won't accept her as is a human being, you know, simply. You know, not anything superior or recognizing differences, but but that she is a human being and not just some sort of object or thing. Where do you think this view comes from? Uh, what uh, are the, if yeah. we could sort out these sort of stereotypes, one would be the sort of the self-sacrificing helpmate and then the, then there's the bombshell sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the sex object and uh, yeah, those are the, the, the two extremes. I think a uh, mother is a recurring one, and of course there are very positive maternal images and very negative maternal mm -hmm. images. Uh, it seems to me that very few mothers would feel either that positive or that negative about themselves, but uh, certainly Portnoy, his mother, yes. you've got an extreme example of a negative image. And uh, well, I don't think anyone objects to motherhood or being a mother, but you like to be something else. I mean, it, it's so obvious, it it's hardly needs saying that mm -hmm. for a man, it is not enough for him just to be a father. But he should be a father, perhaps. I mean, if he wants to be a good father, but he still has some identity. It's not just that he has to earn a living. He is other things besides a father. And well, you want to be more than just a mother. Now, this is something, though, that is, is learned from the year one and even less. And mm -hmm. uh, I was impressed with an article I read about a year ago by a woman named Elizabeth Fisher in the New York Times Magazine on children's literature and uh, the kinds of pictures that little boys and little girls are mm -hmm. getting of what boys and girls should be like. Uh, in one of the books mentioned, there on one page, there was a picture of boy-type animals doing 28 different things, running and eating and reading and playing mm -hmm. and shouting. And uh, there were only two pictures of little girls, and they were sitting and watching. Uh, mm -hmm. Girls are represented as being passive and being yeah. objects. Mm -hmm. So they learn very uh, young what yeah. is expected of them, how to act. Yeah. She said her generalization about children's literature was that uh, uh, boys do and girls are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I yeah. think that 
that is something which is learned very young, not only through literature, but that's an important. And this, I think, is borne out later in the, in the kind of, uh, the popular literature that's available for men and the popular literature that's available for women. The women's magazines, sort of a pitch, beauty pitch, it's mm -hmm. almost overwhelmingly a beauty pitch and the sort of the accessories, the mother and the home and so on. But a man can uh, have a whole variety of magazines that, yeah. that cater to a... Yeah. Women uh, are expected to be satisfied with just a lot less. I mean, uh, everyone wants to be attractive, but it's so supposed to be enough if you're attractive, if you're, um, if you learn how to cook well and things like that. And it's, it's um, well, the idea in, in the media a oh, housewife being thrilled because she has a white wash <laughs> or because her floors are clean. Well, that's all very nice. You don't want filthy floors, but I just, uh, it would be ludicrous this to see I a man that excited I about it. I think the problem is, one of the problems with having ads that do that is, then I go home and I wash my floor. And, you know, I just don't get that big a kick out of it. And I'm not, getting, yeah, what, I'm not getting the satisfactions out of life that I should yeah. be. And, uh, you're, you're an inadequate <laughs> housewife or something. <laughs> Clean isn't clean enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. I think some of the happiest women I know are ones who, in adolescence, they weren't the most popular ones, they weren't the most beautiful ones, and so on. This mm -hmm. parade, in a way, passed them by at that point. So they had to be sort of more resourceful in respect to themselves than yeah. most of the other girls. Yeah. I've noticed that, too. Um, That's true. And, you know, work on themselves a little bit. So they became much more positive human beings in their 20s and 30s, where the others who sort of were able to ride through mm -hmm. adolescence, and then they... Well, they also, I, I noticed that... My said I peaked in the seventh grade. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, that's uh. true. I, I think that some girls who sort of fulfilled the image and did what was expected, and then they sort of expect the fairy tale to come true, that because they, you know, went with the football captain or whatever and were the prettiest girl, to be sort of fulfilling, and then they find their lives sort of empty, what happens yeah. next? You know, because there they are, a pretty young girl, but they don't have anything else, and they haven't developed any skills or their brain. What does happen next, of course, is that they get older. And uh, mm -hmm. in, it appears that uh, middle-aged women do disappear in the media. Uh, they are, they're no longer attractive enough to be sex objects and be advertising mm -hmm. cosmetics. Uh, they're a little too old to be mothers. Mm -hmm. you know, small children, so they're not pictured that way anymore. And all of a sudden, you just don't see women after a certain yeah. age. I think it must be very disconcerting for women when they start getting on and, you know, into their 40s. Especially if, if, like before, if you accept the stereotype, then you're sort of stuck with it. Mm -hmm. You know, that there yeah. isn't much for you and you don't really have much purpose or reason to be. I think uh, that's where the tremendous cosmetic sales come in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea of trying to recapture youth, it's... Uh, it's a very mm -hmm. unfortunate phenomenon. Now, obviously, in the first place, youth cannot be recaptured. And to make mm -hmm. it appear so valuable when it doesn't it seem as if there's anything inherent. Well, everyone wants to be youthful, but there's a, a sort of desperate urgency for a woman that a man doesn't yeah, have. I mean, nothing else. you know, he might like to look younger, but he has a lot more going for him. He can still be attractive to younger girls, etc. Well, not but only that, a man does achieve through time. Well, I don't right. know, when does a man peak? About 40 or 50, normally, yeah, if it's a... Yeah, but a woman that started when he's younger. Um, doesn't seem to go anywhere very often. I mean, right. well, they, she raises her children, and then it's sort of downhill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, unless, and of course, she it's, it's up to her. It, it's up to her. There were mm -hmm. resourceful women do do things. Um, but there's no sort of... The horizons are, are quite limited. You really have to look hard. I think you, ha you have to be unusual to escape from, uh, from the image yeah. which is projected. It's, it seems to me that, uh, say, an advertising company uh, trying to sell a product has a, a very easy market in selling to women because one particular sort of image, a bag that is mother, housekeeper, sex object, these things, really are appropriate to almost all women, and almost all women will identify with, with that picture. Uh, now, if you're trying to sell something to men, you've got all kinds of things. You've got uh, the white collar workers and blue collar workers and business executives and professional Sports people. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and, so and checker more, more <laughs> for a man. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, a, girlfriend <laughs> a girlfriend was mentioning the other day that um, if, she's, if she meets someone and she happens to be very attractive, 
that that is sort of enough, that she's a pretty girl, and they don't expect her to have any brains, <laughs> and that it's sort of a nice extra if she does, if it doesn't get in the mm -hmm. way, if it's not too troublesome. Well, now, in your piece, you said well, she, ought to, she ought to hide her brains even. Though. Yeah, smart, 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 smart girl. Smart woman yeah. never shows her brains. Uh -huh. But for a, a, a guy, if he was very attractive, well, that's all very nice, but what do you do? Where is your head? You know, what have you accomplished? It seems to me examples play so much a part of this. Um, women growing up have very few examples of professional, yeah. professional women. In, uh, I remember as a child, they had these series of orange books with silhouettes, uh, picture drawings, the, the, the biographies, biographies that you could read. Yes. And there were very, very few uh, women mm -hmm. in those biographies. The one I, I, d I found that the only one available to identify with was Amelia Earhart. Mm -hmm. um, well, that strikes me, it, it, looking back on it, it's kind of uh, yeah, I astonishing. Yeah, I remember diligently reading that series, too, now that you mentioned it. I remember I being very impressed with the story of Harriet Tubman, you know, and I just remembered because it, it was unusual in being a story of a woman who... Is one of your heroes? <laughs> well, I hadn't thought about it in maybe <laughs> ten years, but I think so. It impressed me, the, uh, the sort of strength and, uh, you know, self-confidence that she had to do what she did uh, as a woman. Pardon? Uh, as being, um, being born as a slave and bringing people up from the South and doing things that uh, so often you would say, well, a woman would, isn't expected to do that, sort of superhuman. Otherwise, you get stories of girls being airline stewardesses or, or nurses, and more sappy stories, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, girls succeeding. Yeah, I, th I think it would be a shame to put down a job like being an airline steward. It's a good oh, job in many right. respects, but uh, it's a sort of job which, one reason why, s why so many girls would like to be that is because it fits in very well with the other things that girls are expected to be. Other jobs that women might do very well, computer programmers or uh, uh, doctors, well, yeah, or doctors or, yeah, you name it, university yeah. professors certainly, uh, just don't fit in with the image nearly as well. Mm -hmm. They also don't fit in to a certain extent with the business of ma marriage and children often. Yeah. A certain, mm -hmm. a choice has to be made there. You know, you uh, say the business of marriage and children. <laughs> I, learned, <laughs> I wonder well to what extent uh, the institutions exist the way they do, you know, marriage and a mm -hmm. family, because it really is sort of a business. And uh, this is a very, these people do consume things as a, a family unit. And it's easy to beam advertising into well, as, them. Well, as a but, business, uh, if you think of it that way, the partnership is that very often women sort of get the raw end of it. You know, that they're... Um, well, there is a... I think there's a division of labor. Uh, um, whether it's... You're worse off taking care of the children than you would be pr yeah. pursuing a career, I think is a very debatable point. Well, it depends on also what you want. But then you find that, uh, let's say, a woman works a full-time job or an almost full-time job, she's still expected to come home and take care of the family and, and do the laundry, yes. et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that sort of old stereotype hangs on. It's just an assumption instead of a, a realization of, well, what would the, the equal partner should be? Not, well, I'm working, so it's reasonable that you do these things at home. But it's just an assumption. This is your role. You can do it. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, to what extent do you think that we can... One that can be free of these images. I think one, who one is, is so much a matter of the way you conceive of yourself. And the way you conceive of yourself is so often given. I mean, to such a large extent it is given, and only to sort of maybe th a very small extent is it open for choice. What, how you can propose the kind of ideas of yourself that you can actually... Well, uh, it seems as if you spend, you spend, say, 18 years learning how to be the right kind of woman, learning how to be a woman who will be a good wife, mother, good sex object type. Uh, and as you say, it, it doesn't seem as if there's much freedom of movement left after 20, 18, 20 years than to go out and make some other sort of choice. Uh, it seems to me, though, there, there is a real climate of change. Uh, we've been talking a little about the media and uh, women working for the Ladies' Home Journal took over that magazine and put out a kind of a, a liberated issue on uh, alternatives available for women. Uh, another magazine, Newsweek, uh, has had 
some very mm -hmm. forceful women on its staff insisting on being moved up into writing positions instead of just researching yeah. positions. It seems to me, since these changes are taking place in the media, uh, it's going to spread out. We might it's look going for to a be change effective. It's general. important for women to become sensitized to, like, you know, where they get the ideas of themselves. You know, things like, you know, from the dance, that it's, these aren't sort of givens. These are what certain uh, men have thought. And you, you can become aware of the difference between stereotypes and maybe what you really are and, and can feel more willing to make demands and assert yourself and, you know, feel justified in thinking what you think and doing what you want to do and feeling you have a right to do that without, you know, the approval or whatever of, of uh, some man saying, yes, it's all right, dear, mm -hmm. you can do this, or no, this isn't appropriate, you wouldn't really like that, or something like that. Yes, it seems what, what seems to me is happening now really is the possibilities of alternate approaches are really is really opening up giving the individual a chance to think well perhaps not perhaps there is something else for me and what mm -hmm. what can I choose what mm -hmm. can I do I think uh, part of the problem is uh, our society is organized for full-time wives and mothers and so if a woman wants to do part-time work it's very difficult and uh, uh, we've got to start breaking these habitual patterns, and I think many men would appreciate, say, a part-time job or working four mm -hmm. days a week. Or, yeah. You know, so uh, there, w there would be lots of advantages, but uh, we're just not accustomed Let's to working for everybody. Yeah, the, the <laughs> important thing is for people to discover, like, what they want to do, and uh, and I mean, it's it's perfectly fine to stay home and be a full-time mother if it's what you want to do, perhaps at the right time in your children's lives. But not that you have to do that, and not that your husband has to do certain things, and it, he can't make dinner, or he's not a man, and mm -hmm. you can't get a job, and leave the children a couple hours, or you're not a woman. And for people to do what's right for them as individuals, as human beings, and not as a defined role, as a man or a woman. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Kathy. In our next program, we will explore what the law says about women, and what women are doing to change the law. I hope you will join us then. Thank you for being with us today. This program was recorded in the Ann Arbor Television Studios of the University of Michigan. This is University of Michigan Television.